Let us go ahead and get ourselves started with session 16 of 120B, 220B. Today we're going to continue talking about our heating and cooling systems and the calculations that sort of drive the demands that we're going to try to supply with those different systems. We're also going to uh, start heading off into plumbing systems and how we actually provide water throughout the different building, both supplying it and taking it away. So it's hard to believe that there really are only what, one, two, three class sessions left after today. Because uh, the way Latin next week works and the final week of the quarter, we don't actually have a second session. Okay, so we only get that final Tuesday. So we are going to actually be presenting our projects, sharing them with each other on the Tuesday class of that last week. Okay. Now in terms of what you're going to be sharing that final session, it won't necessarily be the complete and 100% like done project. Because you may not quite have it all done at that point. Uh, we don't want the projects to kind of drag too far into, you know, the, past the end of the quarter or into finals week because you've got other important things you want to be doing. But I'm not going to say that Tuesday is necessarily a hard and fast deadline. What you will do on Tuesday, though, is sort of present, you know, work in progress. And at that point, kind of, here's your project, here's the things that I understand, here's some things I don't necessarily understand about it that I can continue to work on. But don't have a sense that you know, all your projects have to be like 100% complete at that time because kind of the very nature of this class and the fact that we're all working on different projects and for different numbers of units and everything's sort of a work in progress to some level. I think it's more important for that session to basically share something that you've kind of learned and that you'd like to continue to work on with everybody as opposed to saying that it's a big final presentation to a, a jury who's going to be uh, evaluating them in a very hard sense. So if you're even beginning to think about six screens worth of uh, PowerPoint slides, you know, don't even begin to consider that because you don't have to do anything like that. It's pretty good. Most people will go through and do some sort of a PowerPoint deck just to sort of guide themselves through it in terms of the key highlights. And as we explain our buildings to each other, kind of overall what your architectural function was, the needs that you were trying to supply, and then basically kind of walking through your building and the different systems and how they're meeting those needs, you know, kind of an overview. It tends to work out pretty well. Necessarily, just because we only have that one class session to work with, you know, everyone will be limited to like 10 minutes or something like that. So don't think about deep ending on it. It really is a pretty light, you know, give enough of it out there, but give us the highlights. Okay, so you won't necessarily be able to dig into anything in great detail. Yeah. What you can do, though, is explain all that sort of stuff in more detail, because you've been putting such good hard work into it. You know, you can go through and really explain any of the details and really flesh it out more in the design journal posting. So go ahead and kind of view that as the bigger place to go through and put things out. Okay. As we think about the integrative design project and these few sessions that we have left, kind of getting ready for that, the idea is at this point, you probably are oh, finishing up, or starting anyway, getting your HVA system in place. Um, again, as you think about that, don't worry about being exhaustive. For example, on the, the same way in the structural side, you sort of put the structural framing in, and maybe analyze a few of the elements, but certainly not the entire structure, even for the HVAC system. I think as long as you have the big gestures handled, you sort of know overall, is there an air handler? Where is it located? How is it the ductwork running from that, going to the main terminal locations? And then even as you think about ducting, the whole issue of if you have a whole lot of terminals hanging off a duct, that term duct is getting very, very large. It might be better to split it into smaller air handlers and uh, more distributed ducting system. Okay, you know, those are the big high-level things we're trying to do at this point. You know, we can go through and run some reports in terms of trying to size up what the HVAC system would be and how much capacity it might be for heating and cooling. But you don't, you know, you're not being held to a very high standard in terms of really coming up with a very tight design. Okay, because we try to integrate so many things together in a lot of different ways. So go ahead and see about getting the HVAC system kind of in place. Ultimately, for your finished models at the end, it'd be great to have your HVAC system in there, as well as your plumbing system. We'll go ahead and talk about plumbing. And the reason we like to get all those systems together is somehow between the structure, the HVAC, and the plumbing, how those things come together in a ceiling and all compete for space, that gets to be the big, critical, kind of conflict-laden area for most projects. So that's why we want you to have that experience. 
trying to see how all those things could possibly fit into the same amount of space and how uh, just the space available and the constraints start impacting on decision to make on each of those different systems. Okay, so it sort of makes sense. Beauty, okay, so we'll have some office hours this afternoon for some people who've signed up. If you haven't signed up, feel free to stick around and kind of just uh, ask questions. We'll do our best to kind of get those answered and get you supported through these last couple weeks because it's always a little wild and wooly, kind of finishing things up. And that's kind of known and acknowledged. Okay, if we're starting with the whole notion of HVAC systems today, what I wanted to go back and kind of pick up on are really two main threads. One is the whole issue of heating and cooling and some funny behavior we saw in the reports last time. I put together a really simple test case that will sort of show us the behaviors we sort of would expect to happen and what the results are on the report. So I want to take a look at that and sort of see what's in those heating and cooling reports. You'll find that always what I end up doing with all these sort of uh, modeling tools is when my complex model doesn't give me the answers I expect, I go back and create a very simple test case and just see if I can get the results I expect there and try and figure out which checkbox I'm not getting right or what settings are just a little bit off. And that's what I did to help us understand those. Then we're going to take a look at uh, where we find information and parts for other types of HVAC components we might want to use. And we'll look at some different little examples of like uh, different test cases of conditions people sometimes try to model. In particular, I want to make sure we take a look at radiators and radiant floors because that's a very common strategy. I want to use that an awful lot now as a very efficient way of transferring heat or cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and start over there. And really to get going with that, let's go ahead and rev it. If you can, download. There's a folder called HVAC Load Calcs out of the campus site. And it really only has a single file in it, but let's go ahead and see if I can find that. So get that HVAC load calcs folder. And inside that folder, you'll find the simple school building for analysis. And again, I always like to start simple. So let's take a look at this little building. I actually ran some reports out of it, but let me go look at it in 3D just so you get a sense of it. So here's the basic little building hanging around here. You'll see that it's actually very similar to that building we've been using an awful lot in the past. I'm going to go to the floor plan. And you'll see that, oh, it's just like the four rooms and some doors. I varied it up a little bit this time, though, in that I went through and changed the window condition on the different sides. So you'll see that, oh, on the north side, it's got pretty much six windows across, pretty evenly spaced. The one on what I'll call the northeast corner, which is now down at the lower portion of the screen, has some windows that wrap around. Over on the northwest corner, it only has windows on one side. On the south side of the building, you'll see it has five windows kind of evenly spaced across the one room and a big curtain wall in the fourth room. So just different loading conditions. We sort of expect that because there are different thermal properties at play here, you have different loads in each of those different rooms. So the spaces themselves are actually pretty similar. In fact, let's even go through and do that. Let's go back and even in here. I realize that in terms of my testing, I sort of biased it a little bit because I have two different sizes of spaces here right now. So if I wanted to go ahead and make that perfectly even, let me go through and I'll move that wall up. Let's see if I can move that wall. It's about 18 feet over here. I'll make it 18 feet on the other side. If I don't, what's going to happen is the fact that the classrooms have different sizes will have different loads because there's a different number of people in that same amount of, uh, or in these different square footages. So I'm just going to kind of shift it around to make it a little fairer. Put it through a head, head comparison. Okay, now in these spaces, I went through and put some spaces. I used the space tool to go through and do that. So under Analyze, we created some spaces. I also created rooms, but for all these different spaces that are placed in here, You'll see they're all placed right now, and they have different names to them. They're all set to a school or university building. I haven't changed anything about that. It's all sort of set to basically the same uh, considerations. 
I did play around with the zone tool a little bit more and kind of got a better handle on how that works. What you have to kind of keep in mind for that, what I always forget is that initially all the different spaces belong to a single zone called default. So really what you're doing when you choose with the zone tool is you can be going through and creating new zones and then adding spaces to it. So whenever you say, and you use the zone tool, okay, it's basically trying to figure out, okay, well, I don't really have very many spaces right now to apply the zone to, so that's what's happening right there. Zones, it turns out, are very hard to pick because if you go tabbing around, like you don't really see them. It's actually right there. There's a line that connects the two different uh, rooms in that zone. I'm going to bet there's another line similarly that are connecting the two different spaces over here. But I actually have a very hard time picking them. Yeah. Sometimes maybe a better strategy would be just to kind of highlight it. And then I'll go through and only check the zones. Okay, so I can edit that and add some more spaces to it. You see there's two spaces in there right now. But it's a little bit tricky to get those in there. Okay. If you want to, again, see how everything's allocated, if you go to the heating and cooling loads report, what ends up happening is you can see all the different spaces. And the thing to really watch out for, there's a couple things to watch out for here. One is the building type, so the overall building type, although your space types will override that. Okay. Location, that's going to determine where the climate file is. Okay. And how it's going to use that. The overall notion of the building service, whether it's a VAV system or a radiant system, that will actually factor into the heating and cooling loads, because each of those different systems are assumed to have different efficiencies. So the loads, the amount of heat or cool we have to generate is going to be the same. It's just really how big the system is. It's going to really uh, depend on like uh, what type of uh, efficiency we apply there. Okay. Um, let's look back over here. Under the details, you can start to see here are the different zones and the different spaces in the zones. And the important thing here is there are all these different zones, all these different spaces in the zones that are assigned to a certain space type, but also assigned to some sort of a construction type. And this construction type is the one where I always get myself in trouble, but I think it's a very important one. So what ends up happening in the construction type is you actually get different sets of uh, assumptions about what the thermal properties will be. And by default, what I think is kind of confusing about this dialog is that all these are turned on as override behaviors. Now, why want to let me do that? Let me go back to the uh, higher level. Let me try it over here. Okay. Now I can turn those on. This is the way it is by default. All these are set to overrides. So the problem with the overrides is it's going to use the R values that are sort of described over here in these overrides for the analytic construction. It won't use the total properties you've assigned in the rivet. Okay, so in general, that'll give you a worse answer because those aren't necessarily very good properties. The reason they put in this capability, though, is that if you just wanted to really quickly try changing from a roof to another type of roof and not have to change all the individual elements, you can go through and say, oh, okay. Well, instead of this 4 inch lightweight concrete roof, I can go through and choose some other ones. And they have a lot of them in here. They have a little R38, R50. So if I wanted to just really see what would be the effect of all the roofs being R50 without actually going through and changing all the building elements, that'd be a quick way to change it. Override the thermal properties. Okay, but we're not going to do that right now. So even what I'm going to do as a starting point, I'm going to turn on the overrides just so we can sort of see what the impact of that is and then go through and turn them back off again. So by default, you're typically right here. Okay, so got the picture? If you got that picture, let me give you one last ever so subtle nuance. This is one that I haven't looked up to kind of figure out what it does. Use load credits is kind of an interesting little one. Just so you know what that's all about, that is the whole notion that, you know, typically we sort of consider all these things in a very conservative sense in that We'll think about the heating and cooling in this one room, and it's sort of just considered for that one room. 
if you want to think about the fact that, for example, the heating and cooling happening in one room could actually flow through the wall and affect another room, okay, load credits lets you do that. Okay, so by default, we don't do that. We sort of consider each of the spaces individually. But if you want to start to think that one room might have some excess of heat or excess cool, and we could actually use that by kind of having, considering the effect of the heat or cool flowing through the internal walls, that's what that does. So we're just going to say OK to these. I'm going to calculate this. OK, and it's going to go through and produce some report. This is all in Boston. What it's basically saying is that, hey, for this building, okay, using the default assumptions for the thermal properties, it's giving me a peak cooling load. OK, and I'm giving me a peak heating load right here. So 97 and 69. If we go zip it on down through the different zones, though, let's take a look at that because you get a little more detailed information. You'll find for that one of the zones, this is zone two, which actually has two spaces, northwest and northeast, so it's kind of the north side of the building. Okay? You sort of see what the heating and cooling load on the piece of equipment which is supplying the heating and cooling for the north zone needs to be. So not only the total building, this is what needs to happen here. Whether that happens through a VAV and we're kind of supplying the heating or cooling very close to the endpoint, or whether that needs to be supplied in something that we're branching off the Marriott Air Handler, you know, is to be determined. But that is just sort of the capacity, that's the heating and cooling that needs to be maintained or provided at the peak times. The peak times actually being one very specific time of year. So for cooling, it's July to o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. That is what needs to be provided to kind of keep us in the cool zone or the comfort zone. You can also start to see within here, oh, for the different uh, zones where we're losing the heat, if you think about all the heating and cooling that needs to be provided, this table is actually showing us a little bit about sort of what's contributing to it. You'll see that, oh, for right now, given these default assumptions, it looks like about 57% of all our heating and cooling is basically going through the roof surface. Okay? And again, that's because we don't have a very good roof. We have these very default assumptions. We hope to be able to lower that. But this will give you a sense of if you're thinking about improving your thermal properties, where to spend the money. Okay? So it looks like roof would make the biggest difference, then wall. Window isn't actually so bad. That's partially because we don't have that many windows on the north side. Okay. So not that the windows are really great properties, we just don't have that many. If I go over to zone three, the opposite side of the building, you'll see it's a slightly different picture. Here, windows have bigger impact because over here, we have a big old curtain wall hanging around over there. So it's basically taking more. And also, if we just look at the heating and cooling, more of it's going to the south side of the building. Okay. So this might be a case where I have a single air handler and two VAVs. Or I might have uh, two air handlers that are handling each side of the building. Because just given this sort of information, the south and the north probably want to be on separate thermostats. Because if I keep the south people cool during the summer, the north people are going to be frigid. And if I keep the north people warm during the winter, the south people are going to be baking. So it's kind of, uh, it's that big sense to sort of split them up a little bit. OK, so that is the default. And if I look at this, what I would basically say about this is we're using the spaces. That's OK. But I'm going to say that this is actually using not overriding thermal properties. OK, so that's one of my reports. You get a whole bunch of different reports down here you keep. Okay. What I want to contrast that to is the effect of actually turning on the thermal properties. Because you'd like to use your thermal properties. You put all that time and effort into kind of putting in the walls and the windows and all that kind of stuff. So let's go back and take a look at that floor plan and see what I have. You'll see that, oh, what did we do out here? Actually, I'll even go to 3D. There it is. I'm going to have to make this a coordination view so I can select this. OK, but for my roof, I've got some nice thermal properties. If I edit its type, you'll see that 
It has an R of 60 right now. It's got a thick, thick layer of insulation there. It's got a really nicely insulated roof. The walls, similarly, I've given them a lot of thermal kind of properties. So if I go to these walls over here, let us edit that type and say that its properties are, what is it? Oh, actually, that's, the, that's a generic wall. Hang on. That's not the one I want. Did I change the type of that wall accidentally? That's generic. Let's see what I did here. Those are generic walls. Well, this is not going to be very good. With generic walls, which have a big old whopping R value of zero, okay, that's not going to be very resistive. Let's go ahead and change those to something a little bit better looking. So I'm not sure where I did that. That doesn't sound good at all. Let me zoom out. What I'm going to do is choose the four walls on the outside. Oh, what do I want to do? What's happening? I say I have that curtain wall in there, which is sort of messing me up a little bit. You, I want to make you a basic uh, wall with a brick and some nice R value in you. What are you doing? I'll do it on the other view. I want to get that wall, and I'm going to control click and get this wall over here. I'm going to control click and get that little leg of the wall over here. I'm going to say, hey, you aren't basic walls, you are the brick walls. And the reason I want them to be the brick walls is that it has an R value of 54. Let me switch this over here. Same thing over here. I'll get this wall. And this wall over here. Okay. I'm also going to change them to brick walls too. Looking good. Those will have some nice thermal properties of R54. I expect that my heating and cooling loads will go down now. Let's go back and I'll even take a look at the floor. Do not neglect your floor because it actually has some heat loss to it too. Let's see what it is saying for itself. Looks like I do have some R value there because I put some insulation under it. It has an R value of 22. Okay, so based on these R values, I would expect to get a little bit better performance if I actually turn on these thermal properties. And the way to turn on the thermal properties is we're going to go ahead and run the analysis again, but we'll turn off the override check mark. That will mean that as opposed to overriding and using the wall properties in the default constructions, it'll go through and use our wall properties instead. Okay, so cross your fingers and that should look better. Let's come back over here and say heating and cooling loads for the building construction. I'm going to turn off these overrides. Actually. This is sort of an interesting case. I might have been able to use that exterior wall override here to rapidly change all of the exterior walls from zero up to a value that was more meaningful. Okay, so what happened is because the override was turned on, the fact that they had an R value of zero didn't matter because it was going to use this R value instead. Okay, it would be worse if I went through and uh, hadn't changed those. But I'll do that. Let's do some calculating and see what our new improved loads are. Okay, 
So you might remember with no thermal properties, we had a total load of somewhere around 97 and 69. Now we have 60 and 19. Okay, so the thermal properties actually make a pretty big difference. So our cooling load went down, our heating load went down quite a bit. We're kind of doing good. So as you're sizing equipment, it's definitely worthwhile to kind of play with the thermal properties and try to make that good. I'm going to say, let me rename this to be, oh, thermal properties on walls and roof. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, Ms. Ruby, what you got? No, so uh, just a quick step back. So before you calculated, did you check the box on the right on exterior walls or you? The first time I had them all checked. Yeah. Okay. The and that time? and that was all over. This last time I turned them all off. So even for exterior uh -huh. walls, I turned them off. Oh. Okay. Turning it off says use your properties, not the default properties. Oh. Okay, so that's why turning them off is very valuable to you. So that's where, I, now I always say that, oh, if something's going wrong and I have some checkbox that isn't turned on or off, it's always something like that. That always gets me in trouble. Okay, so if we look at the wall and roof properties and we go zipping on down here, you can still get sort of the overall, but you also get these nice little summaries for each of the different zones on the north side. Now I'm losing, oh, only 70% for the walls. Actually, let's take, track this through. The first time on the north side, you'll notice, what did I lose? I lost 57 through the roof, 31 through the walls, and only 11% through the windows. Okay, as I shift it over to using my thermal properties, I now lose 18 through the roof, 17 through the walls, and 63 through the windows. So let's think about it. It's not that the windows got any worse, it's just comparatively the windows got a lot worse. So if I start saying there's a weak link in my overall scenario, the weak link is the windows right now. And you'll see on the north side, it's 63% coming through the windows. That's not where the heat's leaking in and out. If I go down to the south side, you'll see it may be even worse. On the south side, it's 82 leaking through the windows. And why is it worse on the south side versus the north side? Yeah, I have all those windows and I have the big curtain wall. So I just got more area that has bad thermal properties. Therefore, I'm losing more of my heat there. Okay, so this is telling me, hey, if I really want to keep on reducing this, the next thing I should probably pay attention to is my glass. And even in terms of my glass, if I only had a limited budget, it probably makes more sense for me to spend money on the south side glass than the north side glass. Okay, in terms of trying to minimize this a little bit, it would probably have a bigger impact. But let's go ahead and take a look at that, see if we can make this even better. So these windows, their properties are all controlled, something called the analytic construction. We have this 1 8 inch Pilkington glass, which is kind of a very standard sort of glass. It has a U value of 0.64, or R value about 1.5. You remember, our walls have an R value of 54, our roof has an R value of 60, so comparatively, like, these things are much, much weaker. You know, it's almost, it's not as bad as being completely open, but it's pretty bad in terms of these R values. So we'd like to try and increase the R values. If I went through and doubled the R value, I would half the amount of heat coming through there. So, yeah, it's not like I have to kind of make them five times the R value, but there's a very direct, lin direct linear relationship between the R value and how much heat is going through them. So, yeah, if I tried to go ahead and raise it up to something closer to three, it would actually have a very big impact. Okay, so let's see what we got. I got all sorts of stuff in here. What the U value is actually just the inverse of the R value. That's going to improve them a little bit. But I'm going to go down and see if I can find something a little bit better. We have all sorts of things with different shading coefficients. 
We have all sorts of things with different reflective coatings. And depending upon whether we're worried about just heat leaking through or if we're worried about solar radiation coming in, we have a lot of different properties we can go with. But I will go through and choose just as a starting point. Let me go to double glazing. Low E double glazing, double glazing domestic, double glazing an eighth of an th inch thick. I'm going to go say double e glazing eighth of an inch, okay, with a shading value of like 0.05. This chip raised it up to 2.8. So it was 1.5, now the R value is 2.8, almost twice as good. Now, this is, I'm really focusing on the thermal transfer through. There's also the solar heat gain and the visible light transmittance. And as I go through and changing things, those values are going to change too. That'll affect how much daylighting comes through, okay, as well as how much radiation, some solar radiation heat gains coming through. So we have a lot of different sort of factors that are at play. I go to double glazing, get 2.8. Some people go hog wild and they say, oh, well, what about triple glazing? If double is good, triple must be better. So we'll come over here to some sort of low E triple glazing. Oh, I'll do like that one. 3.9. So it is better. It's comparatively better. It's also probably a lot more expensive. So there's a trade off in all these things in terms of how far we want to go. Okay, and there's no right answer. Ultimately, you have to do sort of some net present value evaluation over the next 30 years to sort of figure out the total amount of energy being consumed versus the cost. But let's go ahead and just be really dramatic about it. I'll go with a low E triple blast just so we'll see a big difference. Now, this glazing choice I'm making really is only affecting these windows, these windows of the same type. So if I want to get the curtain wall, I have to also choose the glazing there and shift it to be the better glazing. Okay, so glazing isn't changing overall. It's changing on a window-by-window window basis. So if I want to change the glazing, all these were the same type of window. They all changed. But if I want to change the glazing in the curtain wall, and a lot of you in your projects have these nice curtain walls, so you'll probably have to uh, think about changing the value there. What you got to do, it's a little hidden. What you have to do is select one of the panels. This might bring back forward memories of 120A. You have to tab and select one of the panels. And then that opens up the system panel glaze. This system panel glaze is being used for all the glazing panels of the curtain wall. So if I change it here, it'll change all the curtain walls. I'll go zip it on down here. What do I got here? Analytic construction. Doesn't look like it has much of anything going for it now. So I'll go through and change it to, again, double or triple glazing. If I want to show you a big impact, I'll go to triple. But again, that may not be practical. Okay, so now I got really tight walls, I have really tight windows, I have really tight curtain walls. I think this should really cut down on the amount of heat flowing out through those windows. So let's check it out and see what the impact is. So again, I'll go heating and cooling loads. I will say let's go through and calculate it. Again, building construction is turned off in terms of all these overrides. So we aren't overriding, it's really going to use our real values for the interior window, our exterior windows. So we want that to happen. Say OK. OK, so we're down to 55 and 11 overall. OK, so just to contrast that, if we went back and let me go through and rename this. Um, what was this? Thermal properties on windows. If we sort of look at sort of our path through this whole uh, scenario, we started at 97 and 69. We improved it to 60 and 19. 
And then finally, we got it down to 55 and 17. So we are making it better. We're improving things as we keep on going. As I look at this in a little more detail, and I see where the heat is leaking out, if I go especially to the south side, I think we'll see on the south side, these windows originally were leaking out about 82% of the heat. Now it's down to 46. Although the wall and the roof recession uh, percentage are a little higher, overall the number is lower and it's more in balance. And that's what you're really looking for more than anything. You're looking for balance as opposed to one week in the components. So we're actually sort of doing OK. Actually, southeast should be the worst case. That has the big curtain wall. Still at 77, but it's better than it was a little while ago. But this sort of thing is really all about trying to figure out really what the heat cooling load and heating load are, because that's going to determine really how big a heating or cooling unit you have to provide for the building in each of the different zones. So that's what this is all about. So let me just, before we leave all this, though, distinguish two things going on here, or one thing going on here that's sort of important to note. Creatively. This is the notion of peak cooling and heating and cooling loads. Okay? That determines how big the unit has to be. That isn't really a measure of how much energy is being used overall. That's just how big things have to be to handle that peak. So if I really want to understand how much energy is being used, I would do an energy analysis and say cumulatively over 30 years what the cost of that is, the cost of that energy. So. What is that like? Oh, in this case, you know, it's determining the size of the engine, but it's not ultimately going to determine our overall efficiency across our driving pattern. You know, how much we're actually going to use is going to depend on a lot more things over time. It's just really the peak size of the engine, okay, which is not necessarily its average performance over time. Okay. In terms of doing that energy report, I was actually sort of surprised the energy analysis system, is having, analysis system seems to be having troubles today, at least it is for me, when I try to run a report. It keeps on giving me some problems that the energy analysis system is down right now, which happens sometimes. Uh, we call this, uh, I'll leave it at that. Let's see if it'll run. I think it's still going to have troubles. If not, I'll show you an older one that we ran. Is it actually, ooh, maybe it's starting. Check that out. Hang on. It's trying. Starting at 0%. Well, it's doing something. Actually, I'll show you one from like uh, last quarter. This is with the building overrides. It's our same basic building. This is showing you more across the 30-year lifespan. So in this report, you'll actually see a little bit about the lifetime energy use, the life cycle fuel use, and the overall EUI based on that. So here we are with the overrides turned on. That is the default state. It looks like our EUI is about 187. Doesn't sound very good. I'll turn off the overrides. And you'll see the EUI gets down to 65. Okay, so watch out for this issue of overrides. It can make a huge difference. In this case, a factor of almost three in terms of the total amount of energy that's going to be used over time. So definitely worth sort of playing around with and kind of thinking what it is. But realize what the difference is between that load report. It's all about size of the equipment versus this total energy used report, okay, which is about how much money you're going to save over the entire life of the building. Okay, it's similar to the life of the building. Two different really closely related with two different outcomes. Okay, so sort of makes sense? Beauty. Okay. Let me not dwell on that then, and can I talk to you about just a few more cases of what you want to kind of think about in terms of heating and cooling? So I can find my map. Okay. If you need to go through and find some equipment to actually meet this, you're going to come up with, oh, I need 60,000 BTUs. What does that actually mean? And you actually need to go out and find some piece of equipment that can actually go through and provide that. 
Now, there's a lot of equipment provided in the Revit library, and you can start trying to size things based on that. Yeah. No one's going to be holding you to a very precise match between those things. But as you're getting better with your modeling and you want to try to come up with things that are about approximately the right size and sort of do a good job of modeling that, what you can do is as you go through and look for these different pieces of equipment, we can say let's go to mechanical equipment. See what we can find over here. Load a family. If I go to the mechanical section, MEP, airside components, heat pumps, heaters. These are little unit heaters. So little guys. These are heaters that you typically sort of see on a sidewall, like, oh, some of these little sidewall cabinets. These are the kind that you see in hotel rooms that have a little heater, one for every room. Typically, these things, uh, in terms of the overall heating, gets handled more at the air handling unit. And in here we have all sorts of different heating coils and cooling coils and whatever is going on in here. But if I go through and choose one of these, I'll just, just drop it in there and we'll take a look at its specs. I just put it outside there. It has some properties, typically. We'll put it finish flashing there. We'll see if we can figure out how big this thing needs to be. You'll notice this has a type that says six square feet of coil, eight, 10, 12, 30, 60. You might be wondering what all that means. Basically, it has a certain amount of cooling or heating coil. This thing is probably cooling coil. And uh, air square footage that we can sort of blow air past that will deliver a certain amount of heating or cooling. So at six square feet, we don't have very much area to blow air past. So for this one, if you go digging around there and you sort of think about where its capacity is, there's hot water flow, it's chilled water flow. Those are the supply, that's the air pressure coming out. Let's see if we can find a little bit sort of how much heating and cooling it actually can provide. Hmm, not giving me something like that. So it's just square feet of coil. I'm going to have to come up with some other way of looking at this. Notice that I change to much more coil. This thing gets huge. So this is more like the giant ones that are on top of rooftops or up in the attics of like the Gates building, something like that. It's actually quite a large building, it, uh, or quite a large uh, unit. It has a lot more sort of heating and cooling water going through it. It's up to 43 gallons per minute. <coughs> okay, let's see if we can find another one that sort of has something in it that we can take a look at. Let's say, for example, we were going to go through and load in just kind of a little box heater of some type. So I'm going to go into mechanical. And I'll go back to the air side components. I'll go to little heaters. Little unit heater. Or I'll do a little unit heater cabinet. One of those ones that I say typically show up in hotel rooms. Let's see if I can load that in here. three to six kilowatts. Okay, let's see what that actually says in terms of what that'll deliver for us. So if I choose it. Let's see what it is. It has a load, that's its load, you know, 6,000 watts on the uh, electrical system.
That's a lot of watts. That's more than you want to plug into your average bedroom outlet or something like that. Let's see if we have some sort of rating on this thing. Nope, it's still not giving me sort of how much actually heating capacity it's providing. So we might have to do a little looking online to kind of do some matching between sort of what these things are and the number of BTUs of heating and cooling that it can provide. So there's a couple of places you can do that. If you want to go through and just go to any manufacturer's site, which is actually a great way to do this, you can go and get Revit RFA families to download. You can often get a lot of technical specs and product data sheets and get technical questions and answers loaded. So if you go to, let's just go on out to the internet and say, oh, I had heard something about some train heating and cooling units. Heating and cooling units. Residential systems. We have all sorts of different ones in here. Let's see if we can find something out here. A little bit of research, find your product, our product selector, let's see what they say. They all have different ways of trying to do it. I'm interested in, oh, heating and cooling. I'll do it for my entire home. Oh, this is kind of interesting. It's going to try and basically estimate this thing for us. So I'll say that it's going to be, oh, a package system. Oh, I have to do square footage of my home. Interesting. Hmm, I'm going to use natural gas. Well, look at this. It's really going to make us decide all sorts of things. Hey! Nah. How are you? We're doing good. We're, we're trying to find some heating and cooling equipment that'll like uh, provide a certain load. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It is class. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> we set you up for trouble, Henry. <laughs> I'm asking for results. I don't see I'm getting it very much. It's going to train. We're demonstrating how hard it is to actually find a good piece of equipment that sort of provides what we want. So what do we have here? We have um, some different results that it's sort of recommending. Here's a little gas and electric unit. Let's take a look at that. It's giving us some places we might go ahead and talk to to get some consulting about buying one of these things. But somewhere in here, it's giving us, there'll be some sort of capacity. This is sort of the efficiency of all the it, and it's, uh, Let's take a look at over here. Hi, right, wait, we have all these different models. I'm just trying to get the, the BTUs that are coming back out of it. Hi, right, wait, depth. Nominal tons. In this case, it's basically doing it on um, air conditioning size. Actually, how, what's the relationship between tons and BTU? That's one that I'm always very bad on in terms of. What's that? Oh, oh, one times 12,000. It went to 12,000 BTU? Very good. Okay, so if we use that, see, I'll put you to work, Henry. <laughs> if we came back over and we said that, for example, over here with our thermal properties over here, our peak cooling load is actually only about 12,000 for this building, so a one ton unit could go ahead and provide this. This is actually a pretty efficient building because we put such very good windows and doors and walls on it. It's not going to take very much capacity there. If I go back over here to where we started out, you know, it was more like 69,000, so we would divide that by 12. We'd say that, oh, it's going to need somewhere around like uh, six tons or something like that, of capacity to go through and provide that or support it up. Okay, so you can always go looking and try and find things on manufacturers' websites, you know, with varying results. The other way you can try to do it, though, is a very good resource called Seek. And just the other day, Mr. Peter and I were out there on Seek looking for something. Wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yes, we were looking for a split system unit. Okay, so let's see what we can do there. 
Seek.OS.com is really just basically a resource where Autodesk puts it together. They try to get all sorts of manufacturers to put their parts in there and their technical data just so you can find things a little bit easier than padding around on the web all by your lonesome. So if you go to Seek, let's see how this works. What did we decide we wanted? We decided we wanted some sort of a split system unit. That would be one that oh, you often see in a lot of Asia, even in Europe. You have a unit up in the upper portion of a room. Outside, there's some sort of condenser unit, but it's split between those two different pieces. So we went to seek.os.com. We said, let's go through and look for a split system. It came up with, oh, Fujitsu actually makes some. It looks like Johnson actually makes some too. So we can look at either one of these, these little small split systems, okay, um, are made by Fujitsu, these are made by Johnson Controls. This split unit out here is 30 to 50 tons. That's quite a large one. That would be quite a bit of capacity for you know, more a major building. These little ones are the ones we were looking for, so we go over here. And you'll find, oh, there's a little bit of information about it here. Description of what it can do. And then we have some different units that are available over here, and we can download them, kind of bring down the files, and kind of bring them into Revit. So you can go ahead and find different pieces that you need. Let me go over, over here. I'll open that up. You'll see in there they have some Revit families as well as some README that talks about them. But we have some different Revit families out there. This looks like a 45,000 kilobtu unit. Okay, so you might remember we needed 60 for our building. So if we were going to use one of these, we might need to uh, put one on each side of the building. So let's go out and load one of these in. Come back over here. Let's go out there. We'll insert this thing. I'll go out to my downloads folder. I can choose one of these. These aren't all that dissimilar. It looks like for the most part it's just sort of where the connector is on it. Bring that on in. I'll go ahead and put that on the side of the hot building over here. It's still upgrading. Whoops, looks like something came through. Systems, mechanical equipment. Some nice little flexible multiple system outdoor Mitsubishi. I'm going to put it over here on the side of the building. Take a look at it. Not too awfully bad. Looks like it has 230 volts coming in. It looks like it has some, uh, what else is going on in there? It's got some refrigerant lines coming in and out of it. There's two little like uh, piping systems right there. Okay, but that'll give you a sense of it. And if we go to it somewhere in here, it'll probably say something about its capacity. CFMs, kilowatts, twin rotary, all sorts of stuff in there. 
Okay, so you can go ahead and pull in information. Now, for what you do in your models, don't feel like you have to go through and size all the equipment up because that's a really big test to go through and really try and match up all the equipment. I think as long as you have reasonably uh, approximate sizes for what needs to be there, um, you're good for what we need relative to this class because there's a whole art and kind of science doing that. For example, the big thing I'd like to know is really just depending on whether you need six tons or 60 tons or something like that, the big thing is really, oh, whether this thing is going to be something that's like eight feet tall or whether it's going to be something that's three feet tall. Okay, because that'll make a very big difference like in your overall approach about how you put it in there as well as how big the ductwork is that comes out of this thing. Okay, so again, don't worry about that so much. We're not really covering that in detail. It's really more just for you to think about. Yeah, I'm sort of more concerned about really overall, do you have it in sort of a logical location? Is your ductwork running to it in a reasonable way so that if we did go through and size it up properly that you'd actually can have a reasonable assumption? Okay. Does that make sense? Didi. Okay, let us do this. It is two, three, two. Let's do this. Let's go ahead and take a break now. Come on back in five, and we'll actually show you a couple more heating things. We'll talk about a radiant floor system, okay, which is a lot of piping. And we'll say, well, piping's not only good for radiant floors, it's also good for getting water in and out of a bathroom. So uh, we'll take a look at some piping systems and how they work. So please come on back in five, and we will continue.